3. A Key to Adventure The punishment was more severe than appeared at first sight. The recreation centre was something Marty had taken for granted all his life. He visited it every day, occasionally several times a day, for exercises or a swim, to change books, watch a movie or just to meet other fellows and talk. For the first few days, he found himself automatically planning to go there and once he actually picked up a cabin before remembering the ban. He was left with school and home, the three-room apartment and the tiny park with the reservoir. It was a relief that his parents at least did not go on about it. His father told him he had behaved stupidly, that in his view Mr. Sherrin had let them off very lightly, and left it at that. His mother said nothing but changed his books for him and did her best to help him combat boredom in other ways. She talked to him a lot and talked about the subject which had previously been avoided, her own early life on earth. She opened up the bottom drawer of the small locker which held her personal things and showed him old photographs which he had never seen before. Photographs of her family. The family that under other circumstances would have been his. There was one that impressed Marty more than the others. It was a photograph of a man in his fifties, broad-faced and bearded, the curly hair of the beard streaked with white. The face was strong and looked as though it could be stern, but there were laughter wrinkles at the corners of the eyes. Your grandfather, his mother said. I've never shown you any of them before because, well, they wouldn't mean anything to you, would they? They're just photographs, not people. And he was an artist, a, a painter. She nodded. He made a living out of that. No, not really. I think his paintings were good, but they weren't popular with the critics. He sold a few now and then, but not many. Since he died, they're becoming more valuable. Then how did you all manage? His father, your great-grandfather, was fairly rich. Morty said, I see. She shook her head. I don't think you do. There was really quite a lot of money. He gave most of it away, keeping only just enough for us. And not to live luxuriously either. We lived in different parts of the world at different times, but usually in broken down houses in the country, and quite modestly. It was not that he was ashamed of the money, or of being a painter. He worked hard at it and thought it was a worthwhile thing to do. But he liked living simply, and he wanted us to do the same. The money was paid once a month through the bank, and there were times we ran short before the end and had to skimp like mad. Once we lived on bread and herrings for a week. That was when we were living by the sea in Norway, and we had shabby shoes and all my clothes were handed down from my two sisters. No, there was very little in the way of luxury. He could see that while she was talking, she was remembering. Her face relaxed from its anxious lines into a smile. Marty asked, When did he die? She hesitated and the smile went. After we came up here a couple of years before you were born. What was he like? Well, it's difficult to say. A hard man in some ways. It was hopeless to try to argue with him when his mind was made up, and yet very gentle. Birds and animals did not seem to be frightened of him. He used to tame them wherever he went, and he had this tremendous sense of humour. He was always either terribly serious or making people laugh. The smile had crept back. She went on talking about him and Marty listened. He could see how happy she had been as a girl, and it made it worse that she was so much less happy now. This life, confining for all, was harder on her because of the freedom she had known. He asked her what his grandfather had thought about her decision to come to the moon colony, and she was evasive and sad. 
He did not press the point on her. There was no need to. It was very obvious what the big bearded man, the artist and the wanderer, would have felt about such a limited and colourless existence. He felt a sudden resentment against his father who took the bubble for granted, who is neither particularly serious nor humorous, whom it was difficult to imagine taming birds and animals, even if one could imagine birds and animals on the moon. Above all, who was responsible for his mother being here instead of leading the life she really wanted, since, plainly, it was only because of his father that she had chosen to come. Marty had seen very little of Steve since the interview with Mr. Sharon. He'd been asked to visit a lot, to homes where there was a boy of around his age, and his mother encouraged him to ask them back and put on special treats when he did so. Then one day he accidentally overheard a visiphone conversation between his mother and another mother, Mrs. Parker, which explained things. It was clear from what Mrs. Parker was saying that there was a general attempt being made to detach him from what was thought to be Steve's bad influence. The old doubts and reservations about Steve had given rise to the conviction that he had been responsible for what had happened, that he had talked Marty into it. What brought Marty up short and made him particularly indignant was the fact that he had held a similar sort of view himself. He'd been annoyed with Steve for helping to get him into trouble and very much aware of the idea having been Steve's in the first place. He realised he had been, to some extent, avoiding him. The other people thought the same, that this was taken for granted in the bubble, showed him the injustice of it. Even if the notion had been Steve's, he had more than cooperated. After all, he had painted the faces on the balloons, and Steve, who had been friendless in the first place, was being further isolated while he was having people make things easy for him. He waited until his mother had gone to the store and dialed Steve's home. Steve himself answered, his face coalescing out of the blur of the screen. Marty said, Hi, how are things with you? I've known him Briar, you? The same. I wondered if you might be drifting up towards the park. Now? Unless you're busy. It occurred to him that while he was talking that Steve might well be feeling more resentment over the way he had neglected him lately. He showed no sign of it, though. He laughed. Busy doing nothing. I'll see you there. They met and talked about nothing much, but he felt much better afterwards. When he got back, his mother asked him where he'd been, and he told her. A little later, she asked him if he were going over to Ben Trelissi's for tea. Marty shook his head. I'm going to Steve's. But hadn't you fixed things with Ben? No, it wasn't fixed. I said I might drop round. Don't you think you would be letting him down if you didn't go? He has a couple of other guys coming. If I'm not there, they can go up to the centre if they feel like it. Have a game of zing. Otherwise, they have to stick with me and get bored. She sighed, but did not dispute this. Marty said, OK if I ask Steve along tomorrow? Of course. If you want to. I do. It was Steve's suggestion a couple of days later that they should take a crawler out again. The rocket from Earth was due in and it was true, as he said, that you got a better view of the landing from outside. Not that this would normally have been such an overwhelming attraction. It was a sight almost as familiar as the sun's rays breaking through the gaps on the easterly mountains for the lunar dawn. But in present circumstances, filling in time had become important. Mr. Sharon's intention of making them appreciate the advantages of the centre was being fulfilled very effectively. There were five crawlers at the service bay just inside the main airlock. Steve was for taking the first one, but Marty, on impulse, decided to look along the rank. Steve asked what was the point in doing that. The crawlers were identical, after all, but shrugged and followed. 
The crawler at the end was out of line with the others as though whoever had brought it in last had been in a hurry to get back home. They climbed in and Marty stared at the control panel. He had been in a hurry, all right, or else careless. He left the key in its slot. Silently, he nudged Steve, who had come in behind him. There was a pause before Steve said, I used to come here hoping for that one time. I'd given up, though. He pulled the key out and slipped it back in. It's real. What do you think? There's nothing in the rules. I mean, it says you have to apply for a key and we know we wouldn't get one, but there's nothing about finding one in a crawler. We could even not have noticed it till we were outside the bubble. What do you say we haven't noticed it? Are we going to use it, though? Do we have to decide right now? But if we went the same way we went last time, another few hundred metres, and we could at least have a look at what it's like up that draw. Yes, Marty felt a rising excitement, out of proportion, really, with the proposition Steve had put forward. Let's move, then before he remembers he didn't take the key out and come back. He himself took the controls, he pressed the port closing button and the airlock doors closed. Then he put in forward and the crawler began to move. His flashlight, showing that he was going outside, was answered by a wink from the box and the inner wall of the main airlock lifted for them. Marty drove forward and then had to wait while that wall came down. The precious air was sucked out and the outer wall opened to the vacuum. His nerves prickled with the thought that at any moment the man who had left the key would return, that the lifting wall section would drop again, the radio order them in. But nothing happened. He pushed the lever back to forward and the crawler trundled out onto the black basalt rock surrounding the bubble. They reached the point where the governor cut in and stopped the motor. Marty and Steve looked at each other. They haven't called us, Steve said. Even if anyone contacted us, they couldn't tell where we were within a quarter mile. Behind them, they could see the bubble. Or at any rate, the top of the dome with the wireless mast. Level horizons on the moon were only two miles distance and the base was lost behind the curve. Marty turned the key. The motor hummed into life again and the crawler lurched forward. They did not speak until they were in sight of the draw, which had fascinated Steve. It was a great disappointment. It ran up steeply for some 50 yards and petered out at a sheer rock face. Steve said, I've always thought this was the pass that goes up through the mountains. Marty went back to the realisation that people were trying to cut him off from Steve. It was not only that he had thought it unjust. There had been a little resentment as well at their assumption that the balloon stunt had been all Steve's idea, that he did not have the initiative or the nerve to do something like that unless he were dragged into it. He said, Have you looked in the store locker? Yeah, it's full. The last trip must have been a very short one. If it had been refilled, someone would have been bound to spot the key. Steve ran a hand through his black, wiry hair. Why? That pass, it must be somewhere along here. It cuts across the foothills of the main range. The first station is on the plain beyond them. That's not much more than 300 miles. We could get there in a couple of days. Steve said, It means trouble. We might get away with having used the key even with scouting a bit further along, but if we're away for nearly a week. The trouble it meant scarcely bore thinking about. They would have everyone on top of them. Marty felt a slight trembling at the knee. He would not be too sorry if Steve vetoed the plan. He shrugged and said, Just as you like. But we'll never get a chance like this again. Steve examined the reading on the oxygen tank. Almost full. That gives us 14 days clear. He looked up. I'm game if you are. Okay. Marty hoped his voice sounded steadier than it felt. 
then let's get going before they realise we're out here and haul us back. There's one thing. What's that? We don't want to have them mount a search for us. No. The thought was appalling. All the resources of the colony marshalled in a hunt whose cost was scarcely computable. One might waste paint and balloons, but expense of this order was unthinkable to a Lunarian. In that case, we can drop a beacon. They'll pick us up right away, Marty objected. And with the jumbo crawler, they can reach us in ten minutes. Five more likely. Set the clock for delayed transmission. An hour, say. By that time, we'll be well out of reach, especially if we're up in the foothills. This was true. Marty searched his mind for other objections and found none. None that was except the trouble they would be in when they got back. Overhead was the pale crescent of earth, to the east the harsh orb of the sun, twenty-four hours risen. The fuel cells which powered the crawler were even now being replenished with energy from the battery of photoelectric cells on the roof. A journey through the mountains meant a considerable time spent in shadow, but with the sun rising towards its zenith there would be plenty of opportunity for finding patches of sunlight in which they could recharge. They had over twelve days before lunar night fell, more than twice as long as they would need. Steve said, I'll record the message. Marty guessed his hesitation had been interpreted as reluctance, if the message were in Steve's voice, it could seem that Steve was chiefly responsible. He said hotly, No, this was my idea. Steve shrugged. As you like. Not that it makes much difference, we're both for it when we get back. Better not say we're heading for first station. They might send a hopper over and be waiting for us. Marty nodded. He picked up the recorder, flicked the switch and spoke into the tiny microphone. This is Marty. Marty Collins. We took out this crawler. It's number... 217 and we found it had a key left in it. I've overridden the governor and we're going to explore for a few days. Steve de Cross is with me. We've checked provisions. Air and power, everything is okay. We're just going to hunt around. We'll be back before nightfall. Would you tell Mr. Sherrin, please, that any work we miss at school will make up when we come back? I'm timing this to transmit an hour after recording, so don't bother to try looking for us. We're really all right. Signing off now. Steve handed him the metal sphere of the beacon and he slotted the tape spool into place. He checked for transmission and then, consulting his finger watch, set the time. He dropped the sphere into the shaft of the small disposal lock, buttoned the air out into the crawler's general supply and pressed the button, which opened the other end. The sphere came into view in the side observation window, rolling down a slight slope. It stopped after a few yards. Ready to move? he asked Steve. The palms of his hands were sweating despite the air-conditioning atmosphere. He rubbed them surreptitiously on his trousers. Sure, Steve said. You want to carry on driving? We could do the usual shifts. They knew the routine for two-man crawlers on extended patrols. Two hours on duty, two off, for eight hours. Followed by two six-hour shifts to enable the person not driving to get some sleep in the bunk that was built into one wall. Steve nodded. I'll start by map reading then. Not long afterwards, the Earth rocket flashed in the sky, sending on its flame tail into the launch basin. They paid no attention to it. The pass they wanted was less than half a mile further on, past a jutting spur of rock that was clearly marked on the map. Steering the crawler up into it, Marty had a last glimpse of the bubble behind them, its top gleaming in the sunlight. His nervousness had left him through having to concentrate on driving. He had previously only handled crawlers on the more or less flat plateau around the bubble and the incline before them.
was steep in places. The tracks bit well enough to begin with, but further on there was a place where they could not get sufficient purchase and the crawler slipped and skidded backwards, he engaged the climbing spikes and tried again. This time with the sharp steel claws emerging from the tracks to grip and hold the rock, it went up with no difficulty. The slope flattened again and he retracted the spikes. Their points were especially hard and steel but it was important to avoid unnecessary wear on them. The sun not being very high, they lost it almost at once in the narrow defile through which they were climbing. Marty drove by light reflected from the dazzling walls of sunlit rock high above them. The crawlers were fitted with powerful headlight beams, but he did not need to use them. Beside him, Steve followed their course on the map. Look straight forward, he said. We're definitely heading the right way. That zigzag followed by a right-angled turn, and the pass broadens out just ahead. What comes after? You take the left fork half a mile on, then it's fairly straight for something like ten miles, but the contour lines are close. You may need spikes. They sat side by side in silence, watching the walls close in and then recede. Straightforward, certainly. Maybe dull in due course, but for the moment there was novelty in it, a pleasant tension, a feeling that each new vista might reveal something strange. And where the pass broadened to a valley wide enough and at the right angle for the sun's rays to penetrate, it did. Steve drew Marty's attention to a gleam of metal away to the right. He headed the crawler that way. It was impossible that they could have chanced on something unknown, of course. The route was marked on the map and had been travelled, probably, hundreds of times already. But there was a tingle of anticipation all the same. A moment later he recognised the metal for what it was, a broken and discarded rock drill. Someone had been taking samples here. The rock face showed core holes in a number of places. There were other signs of activity, including several empty food containers. Seeing them reminded Marty that several hours had elapsed since breakfast. He mentioned this to Steve, who said, Yes, and I guess I'm cook. What would you like? Moon rabbit roasted on a spit with baked potatoes, or how about a nice fresh lunar salmon cooked in the hot embers of a campfire? Pull over to the nearest stream and I'll see what I can do. Rabbit and salmon came into the very long list of things known through TV and through TV only. Potatoes were grown in the bubble, but were treats for special occasions. There were more economical ways of producing starch. Steve rummaged in the food locker and came up with two cans. Or would you like minced chicken mush with artificial flavouring? Because that's what you're going to get. He pulled the tag to operate the chemical heater. But done to turn, I promise you that. Sounds great, Marty said. We can even have music with it. The last time I looked it was the Pacific facing us up there. We could try for some of that oriental jazz from Tokyo. He switched the radio on and began searching the dial. He found a couple of weak stations, talking, and a still weaker one, playing music through a barrier of static. Then he said, I suppose we could check the service channels, see if they're calling us to come back yet. He clicked into the control frequency. There was no direct radio communication beyond the very short horizon range, but the orbiting satellites circling the moon picked up signals and bounced them back. Someone was talking to a crawler heading for the mines, a routine message. Steve said, either they've not missed us or they're not bothered. I suppose we could leave it on this channel. There had been a sick feeling in the pit of Marty's stomach, which was only slightly subsiding as the even routine voice on the radio continued to talk. It was one to evade regulations, quite another to defy an order openly. He said, do we have to? 
No, Steve said. He switched off. I don't suppose we do. I think those barbecued steaks must be about ready. 